the book of Ecclesiastes speaks to every one of us, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And in his writings, Solomon, he does not mince his words at all because he has learned the hard way about the futility and emptiness of trying to live life without God. Now, if you are joining for the first time, this is the third in our series on the book of Ecclesiastes. King Solomon, he is questioning a lot of things about life. He talks about uh, life being vanity, being meaningless, because at this point in his life, he is at a very low point spiritually. Now, in the original Hebrew, the word for meaningless is the word hevel, which means mist or smoke or vapor. So, Solomon, when he says that life is meaningless, he is not saying that life is without meaning. What he is saying is that life is like a vapor. It is like a mist that it is hard to grasp hard to figure out uh, because there are highs and lows, uh, joys and disappointments, uh, that life is somewhat a mystery. And uh, when you do not have God uh, in the equation of life, uh, life can be very, very depressing. Uh, so that's the place here where Solomon is writing from. There's a point in his life where he abandons God and he begins to worship uh, the idols of his 700 wives. Uh, and as the king of Israel, he ends up leading the nation of Israel into idolatry. So it is a very low time in the history of Israel. And for Solomon, Personally, it is a very low time for him as well, spiritually. Now, he says in the previous chapters, because we are looking at chapter 3 this morning, he says that he had experimented with a lot of things. He tried alcohol, women, power, money, riches, sex, mega projects, vanity, projects but he discovered that without God all those things all those things were meaningless so he found that life was hard to understand hard to grasp because he could not find fulfillment and peace and contentment in life because at this low point in his life he was living without God. He was living a life apart from God. So what he writes about, you know, that comes across to us, it comes across uh, like, you know, in depression language. But it is really the journal of a king who had lost sight of God in the equation of life. And as a result of that, uh, he struggles uh, with understanding life uh, and understanding uh, the purpose and meaning of life. Uh, now, in this chapter that we're going to look at, chapter 3, he makes a very clear distinction between the temporal uh, and the eternal uh, with the sovereign reality that the decisions that we all make in life from the womb to the tomb within that fle fleeting bubble called time that those decisions determine our eternal destiny forever i want to call my topic today from here to eternity and as i said a while ago I'm taking my text from the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, chapter 3, in which Solomon, uh, he discusses four aspects of time from the perspectives of the temporal and the eternal. He says that they are both 
real, the temporal and the eternal, and that they apply to every person, every one of us. And he goes further, you know, he says that what separates the temporal from the eternal for us is literally the matter of life and death. So Solomon, he talks about life and he talks about death. And in so doing, he addresses four main issues. Number one, that life is temporal, that, uh, that death is inevitable. Three, that judgment is unavoidable. And four, that eternity is undeniable. So let's look at the first one, that life is eternal, uh, temporal, sorry. Now, as far as our earthly existence goes, we all are aware that life is temporal. So Solomon, he begins by talking about uh, various times and seasons uh, that we go through. Times and seasons that we will experience uh, in the course of our lifetime. Verse 1 says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. So God, he deals with us on the basis of times and seasons according to his purpose. So our lives go through various seasons and each season goes through or lasts for a particular time. And the thing is that we can link our season, the season that we go through, uh, especially when that season is very trying and difficult and hard, we can end up lengthening that, lengthening that season when we disobey God's word in our lives because God's purpose, it's God's purpose for us uh, that determines the length of each season that he fixes for us. But when we rebel and we try to unfix the fix that God fixes for us, what happens is that he fixes a bigger fix until we humble ourselves under his mighty hand. But on the other hand, when we submit to his will for our lives, when we flow with his anointing and purpose, he says in verse 11 that everything is beautiful in his time. So I'm going to read uh, a few verses here, the first eight. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. A time to be born and a time to die, he says. God, he knows the beginning and the ending of our days. He is the one who decides when we will be born and when we shall die. And he is also the one who sustains us between those two. Then he says a time to kill and a time to heal. And this word kill here is another same word for murder. God is not endorsing murder. But what he's saying here is that in the course, or during the course of life, there is death 
in the line of duty and also in times of war. Then he goes on to say a time to keep and a time to throw away. So God is saying no hoarding, a time to keep and a time to throw away. He says, give it away. At Faith Community Church, we call it the jar of olive oil ministries. Now, many of us would know that these verses that I read a while ago, they have been used poetic, poetically over the generations, over the centuries, as something so very beautiful, really, really beautiful poetry. In fact, those words would make for a great, great song. And uh, I want you to know that many years ago, there was a, a song. Yes, uh, it was 1965. And uh, this, that song was the number one song on Billboard's Top 100. The name of the song was turn 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 sung by the birds and uh, um, it had to do with the turning of the seasons so i want you to listen to the words uh, take a listen and uh, i'll get back to you now i brought that song up not just for you to uh, have fun and to be entertained. There is actually purpose behind my bringing it up uh, and I'll open it up for you as I go along. It was a song written in the 50s by a guy called Pete Sega, but it did not become popular until the 60s, 1965 to be exact, and uh, that is when it remained for three consecutive weeks uh, in a row three consecutive re weeks as number one the number one song on billboard's top 100 now there's a reason why it did not become popular in the 50s uh, and why it became popular in the 60s uh, and the reason is that the culture in the 60s uh, identified uh, very very closely with the guy who wrote uh, those words uh, 3,000 years ago. I'm talking about those first eight verses of chapter 3. You see, those original words in the song, really, those words were not written by Pete Sega. They were written by Solomon because all those words in the song were taken directly out of Ecclesiastes 3. Now, what was happening in America at that time is a matter of well-documented history. There was this counter-culture revolution, and that was taking place during the 60s and the 70s, uh, called uh, Flower Children, uh, and the uh, hippies movement uh, uh, during that time and i remember very very clearly that there were songs like if you're going to san francisco be sure to wear some flowers in your hair that was the time when i played uh, lead guitar in a band called psychedelic sounds there was also uh, another song like uh this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. So there were all these kinds of psychedelic themes uh, during that time, the flower people and the hippie movement. Uh. Now, what marked the cult at that time was that the hippies and the flower children, uh, they were very, quote unquote, spiritual, uh, but they were an anti-God. Uh. In fact, when the huge, the massive Woodstock concerts opened up in the summer of 1969, they opened those concerts with an invocation done by a Hindu guru because the people at that time, the generation at that time, 
they were searching for purpose and meaning in life and that search had taken them to eastern mysticism and eastern philosophy and religion so they were very quote unquote spiritual but they were anti-god and anti-authority anti-establishment anti-war because during that time the vietnam war was already uh, going on and those people then they were against war their mantra was peace and love and they were about free love free sex free drugs free living so that is what really marked the era of the 60s and the 70s that is what characterized the culture of uh, the day the, the, then uh, and uh, the reason why the song turn 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 became so popular th then was that that culture was at the very same place uh, that solomon was at when uh, he wrote ecclesiastes chapter 3 searching for purpose searching for meaning in life, searching for happiness, searching for some kind of fulfillment. Now, that is what the whole time period of the hippies and the flower children was all about. Loose living, free living, free love, free sex. They were trying to understand life. They were experimenting with this and experimenting with that. They were trying to find meaning and purpose in life in a million zillion different things and uh, different ways. So they essentially identified with these words of Solomon because they too the generation of, of the 60s and 70s, they too were at that same place that Solomon was. Uh, and that is the reason why the song, that song became so popular. So uh, as the hippies and the flower children, of you know, as they search for purpose and meaning in life, uh, through all of those things, uh, there's something very very interesting uh, that happened because in the midst of that uh, uh you know counterculture revolution of the 60s and 70s uh, when as i said they were experimenting with this and experimenting with that a whole generation who are anti-god and anti-authority anti-establishment they were engaging in free love free sex free drugs and so on they emerge in the middle of that culture in the middle of all that was taking place uh, they emerge those who realize that all of those things that they were uh, uh, trying to find meaning and purpose uh, uh, in life in uh, that those things only led uh, to emptiness uh, and uh, unfulfillment uh, in their lives uh, they had tried all those things they had experimented with all of those things they had experienced all of those things uh, only to end up on empty so they realized in effect and uh, Solomon he he also came to the same conclusion concerning all those uh, ways of exp uh, of exploring peace and love and happiness and fulfillment in their life and they came to the realization that their quest was in the end empty and not satisfied without god in the equation so in the midst of that whole counterculture revolution of the 60s and the 70s there emerged uh, something called the jesus movement yes the jesus movement where uh, tens of thousands and 
and thousands of hippies and uh, flower children were turning to Christ because they were tired and disillusioned with all of the anti-God, anti-authority, anti-establishment, the free love, free sex, free drugs uh, culture uh, of the day. They uh, were disillusioned with all of those things and they began to realize how really empty their lives were. So by the thousands of hippies and flower children, they were turning to Christ and it was called the Jesus Movement. Now, in 1971, it made the cover of Time magazine. I have uh, uh, a copy here. Let me show it to you. This is yeah, the cover of Times Magazine, 1971, the Jesus Movement. Powerful, powerful, thousands and thousands of hippies and flower people were coming to Jesus Christ. Newsweek documented it. CBS and ABC reported extensively on it. The Rolling Stones magazine documented it too, and a book was written on the Jesus Movement. It also made the cover of Life magazine in 1972, and I also have a copy of it. It was called the Jesus Rally. The Jesus Rally. It made Life magazine, the cover of Life magazine as well. So young people, they were turning to Christ by the thousands. And that Jesus movement became a revival in America. Yeah. And that revival was spearheaded by a generation of young people, a generation of 20-somethings. They had tried it all. They had done it all. And they still came up empty and they came to Christ by the thousands by the thousands and they found meaning and purpose and fulfillment and peace and satisfaction in Jesus Christ and that sparked a whole big revival a great revival in America during that time now this is not just history that I'm talking about you know I brought it up because of what we had happening in the 60s and 70s was really Ecclesiastes chapter 3, which was written 3,000 years ago, happening all over again. Yes, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 was happening 3,000 years later in the 60s and the 70s. Thousands of young people, they were realizing, hey, I've tried it all, done it all, but it was not really fulfilling. And out of that emerges a revival, not just a historical event, a historical reference point, a genuine spiritual revival that took place my friend and the reason that i'm bringing it up now is because this thing is cyclical it's a cyclical thing just not historical it's cyclical because every generation to some degree experiences and experiments in similar ways as the hippies and flower people of the 60s looking, always looking for satisfaction in life uh, apart from God. Uh, a generation of young people questioning the meaning of life. Uh, a generation of young people seeking identity and purpose uh, in life, uh, experimenting sexually, experimenting with alcohol and drugs and uh, 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 and a generation that is rebellious uh, often having a very low view of authority in their lives uh, now they are all symptoms 
of the very same thing that Solomon found out for himself, that life without God is a futile pursuit, a futile pursuit of happiness and fulfillment. But I must say that there's a problem with today's generation. And what makes it more difficult in this generation today is that some of those futile pursuits, free love, free sex, drugs, and, and the whole works, uh, some of those futile pursuits, they have become legitimized in mainstream culture today. And worse, uh, they have also become legalized by governments. Uh, so now it becomes doubly difficult, doubly hard for those people who are realizing how empty their lives are having done all of that and that is simply because they are operating in a culture they are operating in the midst of people who are telling them hey it's all right you okay you fine what you're doing is okay, relax. Uh, just go on with your life, enjoy the life, enjoy those pursuits, enjoy uh, free sex and free living and drugs and so on and so on. It is your life, enjoy it, uh, just live and let die. But really, what we need today is another revival and I pray that the younger generation once again leads the way. Now, as I speak to teenagers today, I am encouraged by all the young people that I meet who have a heart for God and the things of God, who know the truth of God's word and who have the sense, the good sense to reject all the nonsense they hear in the schools uh, and in the colleges and in the universities. Uh, I'm talking about young people who love Jesus uh, more than trends and fads and fashion and popularity. Young people who stand for what is right uh, and what is true, who stand against uh, what the, the, the what today's depraved culture legitimizes and admires and advertises and also what governments legalize now i'm talking about the young people who find their identity and security in the lord jesus christ and my prayer is May this young generation today once again lead a revival, lead a real revival across the world. Hallelujah. So here as we get back to those first eight verses in our text, Solomon, he is describing how temporary life is that life is so monotonous it is an endless cycle of events a wearisome cycle of events life it spins and goes over and over again in cycles one time after another and the whole of life seems to be ordered into this pattern and this is why, uh, why there are so many um, times when he uh, repeats a time to do something a time to be born a time to die a time to plant a time to reap a time to kill a time to heal a time to weep a time to laugh and so on and so on a time for this and a time for that so what we're saying here is everything a time a time a time a time monotony a pattern and uh, and uh, he, uh, he brings across the idea of the tedium of life, that life itself is so tedious. See, he brings across uh, this understanding of the monotony of life, just going in cycles, uh, 
over and over and over again a time for this a time to, uh, for that and uh, we go full circle and come back again now as i was saying much earlier we have made these verses these eight verses into beautiful poetry and uh, as we heard uh, uh, they have even put that beautiful melody and the tate and sang it uh, you know and uh, we have romanticized the thing you know so much over the centuries uh, you know because we come to a place where we declare how glorious it is to love one how glorious it is to plant uh, and so on and we have romanticized the thing so much uh, see so we have taken these lines and uh, transform them into just something that is so beautiful but when we really look at the context of solomon writing this the idea in the original hebrew was that life is monotonous full of seasons and cycles repetitive that life is an endless cycle of events a series of events uh, which comes full circle and then repeats again now we all understand this concept about life you're born you start out toothless eating soft food probably hairless without hair and wearing diapers and then you go through life you get old you end up toothless again, eating soft food, but out here bald, and also wearing diapers. So, basically, Solomon is saying, since life is like this, going in circles and uh, cancelling out itself uh, with all these polar opposites, you know, a time to plant, a time to reap, and so on, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, polar opposites. Then he is asking, what then is the point of all of it? He says this in verse 9, What profit had he that works in that wherein he had labored? In other words, what profit do you get out of your labor? What profit do you really get out of? of your hard work and then he comes to realize two things about how temporal life is that time is in god's hands and uh, also whatever time or the season of life that you find yourself in he says enjoy it now time as we all know is in god's hands and he is the one who orchestrates and organizes times and seasons. It is not within our control. All we can do is to measure time, to mark it. That is all that we can really do because time is something that keeps moving on and we have no control over it. It moves on with us or without us, but it moves on. All that happens is really that we are given a certain allotment of time but all of it is in god's hands now god he is outside of the time space matrix but he intervenes in time whenever wherever and however he chooses because god he is sovereign daniel 221 says God changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. So, you see, it is his prerogative. It is his authority to determine times and seasons. Remember, Jesus, even speaking to his disciples concerning his second coming, said, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father had put in his own power so at the end of the day my friend we've just got to live out the time that god gives to us and fill 
that time with his purpose for our lives. Now, since we cannot hasten time or delay time or control time, we simply need to get to the place where we put our trust completely in God's timing for our lives. Because his timing is always perfect. The Bible says that everything is beautiful in his time. Now, we may not understand the season and we may not particularly like the season that we are in. But know this, God's timing is always perfect. He is sovereign concerning time. We cannot change it, we cannot hasten it, we cannot de deny it, we cannot control it. All we can do is to trust God and uh, trust Him in His timing. David said this in Psalms 31, My times are in your hands, Lord. You see, and that is something that we all need to understand today, you know, to understand in our own lives so that we can declare to with David, my times are in your hands, Lord. Now, the first, so the first aspect uh, concerning time that Solomon discovered was that time is temporal. The second aspect is this, since God controls times and seasons, then our objective in life ought to be that whatever time or season that, you know, we find ourselves in, we ought to simply enjoy it. <clears throat> and by enjoy, I mean that you see God in the season that you are in, regardless of what that season is. And that also that you recognize in that season the goodness and the faithfulness of God in that in the present season, in the season that you are still in. Because too many times we get stuck reminiscing and, or uh, 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 reminiscing on the past or regretting the past or just looking for future times and uh, in the process we miss the present and you see that is the part that Solomon came to realize I need to appreciate and enjoy right now right here right now right here right now where God has me and by doing that uh, you see, you begin to see God in your present moment. Now, again, I must say, too many times, we want to hasten things along or spend too much time obsessing about the past. Let me say this about the parents. Listen, parents. We look at our kids and we're always thinking about the next season for them and uh, you know I know that our intentions are always good and we want progress for our kids and so on that fair enough because you see I understand that you do come to a place where you know things become monotonous, monotonous for you life becomes monotonous and you say I can't wait for my baby to get out of diapers. So, you're looking for the next season when you don't have to change stinky diapers. Then, uh, the child is out of diapers and uh, they're uh, potty trained and you say, well, I can't wait for them to go to kindergarten, preschool. Then it follows, you cannot wait for them to go to big school where they can fix cereal for themselves on a Saturday morning so that you can sleep later. So you see, you're always thinking about the next season for the kids. And what happens is that 
along the way season after season passes and you never ever enjoy the moment and before you know it those children they are out of the house and you are thinking to yourself hey where did the time go did i spend enough time with my kids now there's a flip side because uh, teenagers they can be guilty of the same thing as well because that kind of uh, mentality and feeling begins to kick in around those teenage years you see friction starts setting in and uh, you hear talk like i can't wait to get my driver's license so you get your driver's license and the next thing is I can't wait to get out of the house. Eventually you get out of the house and you know what? You start thinking, wow, you know, I had it good back home. So the idea here is that we are wanting to rush the next season. And in so doing, we end up remin reminiscing about the past we end up wanting to rush the future and we forget that we have a day a today to enjoy we forget to enjoy the now that we live in we do not live in yesterday we are not living in tomorrow the now is the only time that we live in here's a famous quote yesterday is the past Tomorrow is the future, but today is a gift. That's why it is called the present. Listen, friend, today is all that we've got. There's my quote. Today is yesterday's tomorrow and tomorrow's today. So at the end of the day again, today is all that we've got. That's why Solomon said, uh, I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. Enjoy each season you, you are in, my friend. It is not going to come around again. Carpe diem, sleep, seize the day. But you see, what if there is a bad season? What if it's crappy dear you know what i am i'm talking about and some of you may be saying i'm in a bad season and i can't wait to get out of this season i have good news for you and in all honesty we have to learn that there are lessons that god intended for us to learn in each season see and uh, during that season god's grace is always sufficient because uh, sometimes the season that we are in is hard and god knows it but he says that he will never allow you to reach your breaking point uh, see he will always take you through your season and get you to the other side uh, whole and alive because God in his grace he will always usher in that new season in in your life he will bring you into that new season but in his time this, this is what the scripture says God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tested above that you are able but will with the testing also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it now i'm not suggesting for any one moment that if you are in a bad season that somehow you are to enjoy it no no i am really speaking to the context in which solomon is writing these lines what he's really saying is this uh, don't regret the past season and don't always wish for the next 
Just savor the now that you're in. Enjoy where God has you now and do it with his grace and his peace. Learn the lessons of that season. Learn it and do it with grace. Blaise Pascal, some of you would know her, a 17th century French philosopher and theologian. He's the one who coined the expression that there is a God-shaped hole in the inside of every person and could only be filled by God himself. Now he wrote these powerful lines. If we live in the past or live in the future, we never live because we always miss the present. We have to learn to enjoy the season we are in because it means then that we are trusting in God's timing. So the first aspect of time Solomon wrote about is that time is temporal, it is fleeting. The second is that death is inevitable. He says a time to be born and a time to die. And I think that Solomon is not being uh, pessimistic here. I think that he is being realistic, realistic of the fact that everyone will die. And I say everyone will die, of course, um, um, except all the born again Christians who are still alive uh, when the church is raptured. But until then, death is inevitable. As far as I know, I checked the statistics. So far, 10 out of 10 people always die. That's the reality. And uh, we have to prepare ourselves for that reality. Because nobody wants to die. Everybody wants to live. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger once said, and this is a quote, I have always been extremely angry about the idea of death. It is such a waste. I know that it is inevitable, but what does that mean? You, your whole life, you work, you try to improve yourself, you save money, you invest wisely, and all of a sudden, poof, it's all over. Death angers me more than ever. He sounds a bit like Solomon here. Like, I just don't get it. Life has no meaning. You try to do the best you can all your life. You earn, you save, you try to be successful, and then, poof, it's all over. You die, and you leave all of your goods to somebody else. Listen, my friend, if you are not saved, if you do not have a close personal relationship with Jesus, if Jesus is not the central focus of your life, you are apt to feel the very same way like Solomon and like Schwarzenegger. Because life is going to be depressing for you. You are going to feel unfulfilled and empty because you are trying to fill that God space with everything except God, but doing things, acquiring things in your life and so on, but not with God. So really, you will not have that hope that Jesus gives, that hope of who Jesus is and life for you will become a very fearful thing. I mean, listen, death by itself, just thinking about death, that's a very fearful thought in the sense that to the unsaved person, it is an unknown. I'm talking about a person without Christ, death is still an unknown to him. But when you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, at least uh, you know that when death comes, it is not the end uh, because Jesus, he gives you a grace to live and a grace to die. 
and uh, for the believer in Christ, uh, death is only a transition because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You immediately transition from this life into the very presence of Almighty God. You step from here right into eternity in a split second, in a nanosecond. So de death is just the trigger. It is the transition trigger from here to there, from here to eternity. Now, if you are not saved, you've got to determine what eternity you go into, whether it's an eternity with God or an eternity without God in hellfire. Now, of course, death is always grievous to us whenever a loved one passes. But to that one who dies in Christ, it's going to be a glorious glorious transition and uh, don't you believe what those jehovah witnesses and those other cults uh, tell you that when you die you go into the ground and you soul sleep that you go into some kind of unconscious suspended animation sleeping don't believe that crap because the bible makes it crystal clear that when we die, the body grow, goes to the ground and decays, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. That body is gone forever. It exists no more over time. But the spirit which carries the, the soul, I'm talking about our mind and our will and our memory and our emotions and so on, that spirit goes to be with the lord because the spirit of man is the real essence of who you are because it is the sum total of your soul and the breath of life that comes from god remember in jesus's account of the death of both lazarus and the rich man he tells us that one went immediately to Abraham's bosom, that's heaven, and the other went immediately to hell. Yes. But as mysterious as death is, it is nothing for the Christian to fear. Because the scripture tells us that <clears throat> when Jesus resurrected from the grave, See, O oh death, where is your sting? O oh death, where is your victory? Because, I mean, how can death sting us when it has no power over us at all? Because when God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, the Bible says that he defeated death, hell, and the grave once and for all, forever. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Jesus said, He that heareth my word and believeth on, on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. From death unto life. This is that again. From death unto life. I want you to get that into your spirit. From death unto life life it does not say from death unto soul sleep no from death unto life jesus said it's a crossing over from death unto life so although death is inevitable because the bible says it is appointed unto man once to die born again christians should never ever be afraid of death but unfortunately, because Solomon is not in a good place spiritually here, he is writing some of these verses from a negative, ungodly perspective. But 
what is comforting, the redeeming factor is that at the end of the book, when he gets to the end of the book, we realize that he comes right back to the Lord. Now, the third aspect of time that Solomon considers is eternal judgment. That judgment is unavoidable. Hebrews tells us it is appointed unto man once to die and after death the judgment. Uh, verse 17 in chapter 3 here, I said to myself, God will bring into judgment both the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity, a time to judge every deed. So here Solomon is quite correct. Every single person, my friend, saved and unsaved, must stand before a holy God to give a, a, an account of himself. You see, the decision that you make in this present life, in the temporal life, will affect the eternal. See, that eternal that every one of us will be moving into either in heaven or in hell but right now there's this window of opportunity that we have right now a window of opportunity for any person who has never ever accepted jesus christ as your lord and savior to surrender your life this moment to to jesus and get saved now this very moment just ask him lord jesus come into my life uh, as my Lord and Savior. That's all it takes. And I also want to speak to every true believer in Christ here today. That in this, you know, window of opportunity, in this temporal that we live in, to surrender your all to Jesus Christ and to be fully committed to walk in all of his will and also to finish the work finish the assignment uh, that he has given every single one of us to finish before we die because your decisions now will impact your eternity so judgment is a reality and we all have to give account but here's the good news for every christian that judgment for us is was already satisfied at the cross the punishment for our sins that we supposed to pay was placed on jesus through his eternal sacrifice at calvary and now the bible says that we have been made the righteousness of god in him so judgment day for the christian is not a day of condemnation it is a day of commendation it's not a day where uh, uh, to determine whether you go to heaven or to hell no it is a day for uh, what rewards god will bestow upon us uh, according to our faith works finally number four uh, this aspect of time, Solomon also commented on that eternity is undeniable. You see, Solomon is aware of the concept of eternity. He recognizes the eternity of God, that everything that God does will last forever. And then he makes this remarkable statement in verse 11. God has set eternity in the human heart. Wow! In other words, he's saying that God has placed an eternal longing in the inside of every person, every one of us, so that there is a cry for something more than this temporal world has to offer, that there is something more than the here and the now, that there is this innate sense in all of us, this undeniable understanding that life is more than the here and the now, that there is more to life than what we see and what we experience, and every person, everybody is in pursuit of it. 
you know, the Hindus and the Buddhists, they are in pursuit of it through reincarnation. The Muslims, they are in pursuit of it through good works and jihad. But the Bible says that anyone can find it through a relationship with Jesus Christ. So God has not simply placed the concept of eternity in our hearts. He has made it a reality for us so that we can lay hands on it for anyone who would put their trust in Christ as their Lord and Savior. Heaven is real, my friend, and eternity awaits every man. For the believer, heaven is our hope, it is our joy, it is our inheritance as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And anybody, anybody at all, can have access through the same Jesus Christ. But heaven as not, it's not as some people believe that it is an uh, inevitable and an automatic destination for everybody. You know, we go to funerals and, well, Uncle Charlie dies and everybody say Uncle Charlie is now in heaven. <laughs> I hope Uncle Charlie is in heaven, but we throw that term around like, like if everybody goes there when they die. Yes, granted heaven is accessible to everyone, yes, but everyone just do not end up there because the access, the access to eternity, to heaven, is through the Lord Jesus Christ and knowing him as your personal Lord and Savior. So, Life is temporal, death is inevitable, judgment is unavoidable, and eternity is undeniable. Let us take a moment and come before the Lord in prayer, my friend. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your word to us through Solomon, who challenges us, even though he is at such a low point in his own life, but he challenges us to consider with sober minds and a clear understanding why you give to every one of us this commodity called life. Lord, we thank you for sending Jesus to give us eternal life in exchange for an, an, a temporal, unfulfilled life without you. And we understand, Father God, that life without you is futile and empty. So we pray, Lord Jesus, that every one of us this morning will examine ourselves to examine where we stand in relationship with you, Lord. Lord, I pray that we will take a long, long look at our own lives, our own selves, and that we will seek after your mercy and your grace and your forgiveness and your power in this time of need. Lord, put a desire in each one of us for the things which you offer, not what the world offers. Something more than the temporal. And I pray, mighty God, that this message today will encourage us mightily and bring light and deliverance to our souls. Lord, we commit our lives into your hands, into your safekeeping. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for your guidance. Give us a sensitivity, God, to what to hear and what you are seeing so that we can walk in obedience to your will. We ask it done in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. And now if you would stand and receive the blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen and amen and amen. God bless you richly. See you next week.